Welcome to the LND Go Beyond podcast. This is the show that brings you real, actionable workplace learning insights from some of the brightest minds in the LND space. This season, we're diving into the realm of learning impact. Join experts as they share their knowledge and experiences, helping us push the boundaries of what's possible when it comes to delivering impactful learning. Get ready to go beyond. Enjoy the conversation. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of LND Go Beyond podcast, where we gather insights from experts to help LND teams truly go beyond. Our focus in the season, as you know, has been on learning impact. And today we have someone who will share a practitioner's perspective on how this topic plays out inside organizations. Our guest today is Laura Bartos. Laura. Very welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Amit. Glad to be here. Excellent. Laura, let me take a, a brief moment to introduce you to our audience. Laura is the Chief Learning Officer of Human Health Project, and she is the Head of Learning and Development for Centerwell Pharmacy, a division of Human. At the Human Health Project, Laura helps the organization set near-term and future strategy scale up its patient education programs, and increase its reach to new groups of patients and caregivers. At Humana, Laura's teams create, deliver, and track learning and development programs for the pharmacy's 12,000 associates. Laura's organizational effectiveness team tracks operational results and develops learning metric strategy to improve their business impact. Now, that's very exciting. That's very exciting. Laura, I'm so glad that you could join us today. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. I'm really excited to be here and to hopefully have a great conversation with you about um, making an impact on our organizations and um, how other people have done that. Excellent. No, thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, but before we get started, you know, Laura, why don't we learn a little bit about what your journey has been? I know you you started off as a teacher so it's going to be even more interesting for our audience to learn how did you transition what your you know experiences have been and how did you get here where you are today sure well i started um back in college i was a business major thinking i was going to be a big bad business person and i didn't really know what that meant <laughs> i just thought i want to wear a suit and and have all the have all the meetings and now i realized that was kind of a, a silly little thing that i um that i wanted but i ended up switching majors to english and i just adored literature i thought it was um, exciting and insightful and i took that love of literature and i became an english teacher it was a beautiful career but it was also really heartbreaking and um, the, the stories that people tell about their classrooms, especially in high school, the Title I school, very, very tough. Those stories are all yeah. only a, a little bit of the, the truth of high school. So it was great. I loved it. I love my students. I still keep in touch with some of them, um, but it was really heartbreaking. I was sitting in the, um, the living room one night with a pile of papers reading, and I think it was like midnight. I was doing grad school at the same time. And uh, my husband came in the room and he said, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm grading papers. <laughs> he said, no, you're crying. I said, no, I'm not. But it was, it was a great lesson into um, how much we carry the stress of our day with us home. And I decided I, I couldn't carry that home with me anymore. It was, it was too much. So I joined Humana um, almost 16 years ago now and never looked back. I loved, I loved teaching. I loved curriculum and instruction, but the heartbreak was very intense. So at Humana, I've done pretty much every job in learning now. 
I started as a learning consultant, basically doing instructional design. And that was my bread and butter as a teacher. And then um, I did learning system design, which was basically like e-learning development. We would do basic Dreamweaver web pages and articulate storylines and rise. Well, no, we didn't have rise at the time yet. It was back. This is, this is, I'm not, I'm not going to date myself, but it was a few years ago. And um, that was great. And then I started um, moving up into leadership and I've done several different leadership roles now at Humana, which has been a great career. It's been a wonderful place to really grow up professionally and learn a lot of awesome lessons. There's some great, great friends and, and partners that I've met over the years inside of Humana. It's been a great journey. And then recently I started um, at the Human Health Project, which is a 501c3 here in the US and in Ireland. And they provide patient education and advocacy to people in communities and online. So I am their chief learning officer now, which is a, a great journey and the next next exciting thing. I'm still at Humana and I and I do this. It's a volunteer role. All of our um, roles are volunteer at the Human Health Project. But that's my journey. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. And I know, you know, teaching uh, high school kids is is not easy. It can it can be really difficult. Fantastic. No, thank you. It's a wonderful journey. I love that you've been with Humana for so long, and it has given you all sorts of opportunities and exposures. Uh, fantastic to hear that. Excellent. All right, Laura. So, Laura, coming to our topic, which is more on learning impact and you know how organizations typically handle this internally. So I think the challenge most organizations have is in aligning uh, learning to business. You know, that's been a mm -hmm. typical uh, issue that we find uh, in organizations. Let's start with first understanding. How do you define impact from training or learning programs? Is, is there a way that you and your team think about it, talk about it? So impact for us is changing behavior. And that can show up in several different ways in the business. It can be an associate knows how to do their job better. Associate is our humana term for employee, by the way. So if I say associate, I mean employee. Um, so it can show up in how an associate does their job, how well they adhere to process, procedures, how compliant they are, if there's compliance rules to follow. It can mean um, how are their quality scores or other important measures of how well they do their job. It's basically how, how are we changing what happens in somebody's job in the business. So is this something that you end up uh, having a, a system to measure on a, on a program by program basis, or is it uh, more in the structure itself that every program gets measured uh, in, a, in a particular way? So is it consciously being done on a particular program or is it being done as, you know, there is a culture of measurement on almost every program? I would say we're on, we're on a journey as, as a learning organization. Um, you know, I have a really large um, organization, three different teams of really talented learning professionals, and we are working on more reliably measuring our impact on those particular metrics. So I would say as a whole, we're doing better about evaluation. We have a, a great person on our team who does all of our learning evaluations. Level one, level two evaluations are easier. Um, they're simpler, but when you start to get into level three evaluations and level four evaluations, that's when it gets tougher. Um, so we are trying to standardize all of those level three evaluations and get to level four so that we can know across the board how we're doing for the business. That's not something that we've always had in place. That's something that has been a journey. And I would say that's probably a journey that a lot of learning teams 
are on too. You know, I talk to a lot of other learning and development leaders and it can be a struggle to get to how are we impacting someone's competency back on the floor, back in their job? How are we impacting, you know, measurement criteria across the business? What kind of impact are we making to the business? Um, So it's definitely something we're growing in and building. It's not something that has been necessarily a skill that came naturally mm, yeah. from the beginning. And, and that's absolutely, you know, uh, the situation for most organizations. And even if they have cracked it in terms of getting at level four on some programs, it is not necessary that they are able to do that for all the programs, or even if it is required in some of those cases. Very interesting. So, Laura, is there a way we can pick up maybe an example of uh, where you may have gone to level three, level four, anything that you may be either currently working on or finished? How do you go about doing that? You know, maybe we can uh, look a little more, you know, deeply with an example. Under the hood, so to speak. Yeah. So we are working on a program where we identified a top driver of cost to the business. So a a quality issue that cost us a lot of money. And we figured out that particular quality issue cost us in the thousands of dollars every time it happens. And so our team is testing out. This is a very long ongoing project. So it's, it's it's something, sometimes these things move in glacial terms, right? Um, But our team is testing out utilizing technology um, to provide better practice before these associates get out into what we call nesting, which is where they, they're called associates where they take real phone calls. Um, basically, can we use this better practice or better opportunities to do the thing in a sort of simulated, seemingly live environment before they get out there and they do the real thing on their real job with a real person who is, you know, their client or a member, whoever it is. Um, It took a long time to build it. I can tell you some of the the details of that, but um, we are, we now have a measurement strategy in place so we can identify what this program does. What you're looking at is you've identified a, a, a business impact area and worked backwards probably from there, that this is an issue which is causing us a lot of uh, monetary loss, let's say. And to tackle that, you're building, uh, you probably identified that practice is what is missing and to handle that or fill that gap, you're saying, let's use simulations so people can practice in a, a you know, fail safe environment before they are really pushed into a real environment. Exactly, exactly. And, but you know, from, learning best practices that people learn most of what they retain by doing it. So where there are places in our learning programs where people aren't doing the thing, they aren't practicing it, that's where there's no retention of information. That's where they come out of the classroom and they're good for a week and then they forget or they didn't really, really know it because they they understood it up here, but their body hadn't done it. You know, they hadn't done the keystrokes, they hadn't taken the phone call, they hadn't had those conversations. So we really were just trying to figure out, based on that thing that we want to get to, how do we back into a learning solution? Because a learning solution doesn't matter if it's not going to help anyone do their job better. That's what we really wanted to get to. So we started with the end in mind and we said, what's the gap? What's the gap in what we're currently doing that's not allowing them to get to a higher quality score here. I love that uh, statement. A learning solution won't matter if it doesn't let anybody do their job better or doing something better. And, and, and I think that's crucial. And what I'm sensing here is you're almost designing for impact rather than searching for impact. You know, you launched a program and then you are saying, oh, maybe we may have made an impact Level one, level two, probably you would, but essentially level three will never come if you've not designed for impact. So what I'm uh, probably seeing is uh, a structure by which you are influencing the design itself so you can get impact. 
Mm-hmm. And it's, I will say that <clears throat> many programs, many curricula, that is not the way it is intuitive to design things. Because a lot of times, you know, your clients will come to you and say, can you help us do this thing, train this mm-hmm. program, give us this new system training. And you just say, okay, and then you, you build, okay, we're going to train on this system. It needs modules A, B, C, D, E, F. And then we're going to put in some knowledge checks and maybe some practice at the end. And then it's done. That's a pretty standard approach to, you know, building the, the training, right? But it doesn't get to what is the real problem that the business is trying to solve? You know, if it's a new system, well, why did they do the new system? Why did they take away the old system? Why did they build a new system? What was wrong? What were the the scores that people weren't getting high enough on? Is there, is it too cumbersome and time consuming and it's causing our phone um, handling time to go up? So think about the end before you start beginning the program. That's what we learned. Fantastic that you say that. Think about the end before you begin, uh, because that's where uh, a lot of programs may go wrong. Uh, and that leads me to you know understanding how have you or what have you uh, created in terms of partnerships in the organizations, uh, because this is more of a consulting role and not a lot of L&D teams haven't really been at that position where they can go back and ask the business, why are you changing the system? You know, like you just mentioned. So uh, what has been your uh, mantra for this sort of questioning and consulting? Yeah. I would say <clears throat> that the, my relationships with the business are probably the most important part of my job. And it's, probably my favorite part of my job because I have amazing clients and the pharmacy organization that I'm in has just so many wonderful leaders. A lot of them have grown up in the organization, but the common core of, of that experience is that there are all these wonderful, really talented people that I get to work with who want a partnership. And I I try really hard to be, um, a trustworthy partner. That's probably that's probably the, the biggest thing in my mind is that they're putting their trust in me to just help them to build better things. And I want to be the person that they go to to say, hey, can you fix this? Um, so the partnerships that I've built with my clients are very, you know, relational. I, I care about their lives. I care about their their families. I don't just care about care about their jobs. And <clears throat> so trusting are an essential part of this. And I always try to remember, you know, when it's a tough day and it's another Zoom meeting, we're all, we're all Zoomed out, right? We're, there's so much fatigue. Even when it's a one-on-one and it's toward the end of the day, if it's a client, you know, this is my opportunity to get to know them and really what's plaguing them, what's keeping them up at night, what challenges are they having? Um, they might not remember a particular project that I had my teams work on or, you know, a particular question that they asked me or a particular program I ran, but they're always going to remember how it made them feel. And I know that's not like a hard, hard measurement, but I would say it's more important that we have that relationship first so that we can create impact down the road. So the relationship is really the bedrock of everything that I do in my role. Excellent. And I think that's that's really the starting point of uh, being able to advise someone unless they trust you, unless they, and in the relationship, if you care for each other, that's very, very difficult. If you show people that they can trust you and you're vulnerable with them, they show you their vulnerability too. And you can get a whole lot more done and it's a much better relationship if you're real with each other. Does that also need a uh, domain knowledge uh, at your end to build that trust because as you said you you've come from a different background some of these business stakeholders may be you know in this domain forever for all of their lives so how how critical is that part for you 
I would say there is some element of domain knowledge needed. I do need to understand how the pharmacy organization works, all the different lines of business. What are their, um, you know, what are their products? What are their challenges? All those things are really important. Um, I don't need as much on the ground knowledge mm -hmm. of the organization as much as my associates do. So where I can have um, a higher level, more strategic understanding of what's going on. My teammate, uh, teammates, team members, and leaders, they really need to know a lot about the teams that we're supporting. So when I hire facilitators, I hire facilitators from in the business, people who've been, you know, helping us with a session who have shown great potential in teaching other people. Um, I love hiring people from in the business because, first of all, that gives them some street cred. They actually know what they're talking about. Um, and then it actually helps us be more effective and be a better partner to the business because we are bringing people in that they know and trust. So it's both, we, we create better content, we build better programs, and then also it helps us with our partnership. Yeah, great. Uh, and the second part to that question was also, it would take time, right? Building those relationships uh, would not happen magically over a few days time. So in, in your view, you know, uh, what what's the time frame that, that you think it will take typically for build that sort of a relationship where you are able to consult your business partners? Well, I would say, you know, the first time I'm trying to meet with someone and, and show them what we can do for them and, you know, start building that relationship, they might say, okay, that, you know, this is, so this is cool, but they're not going to trust me until we have a pretty solid foundation. So, I mean, at least several months, um, the more we interact with each other, the more their opinion of me and my organization is going to be negated or solidified, right? So every interaction, you know, increases their opinion of us or decreases it. Um, at least, so at least several months, I would say the, the longer I've had a relationship with people, the more they know they can trust me and that I'm going to do what I can to help. Yeah, so at the, at the very base, you know, anybody who's trying to do this should expect some time to be invested in building that relationship. Yes, and I would say large organizations are slower moving in nature anyway. So it is more difficult to make quick change in those large organizations. Um, but that gives you time to build those great relationships and have a solid foundation. Okay, excellent. Okay, and you talked about, you know, uh, when we talked about the domain knowledge that you bring in people who will have more uh, knowledge at, at that level. What other ways, you know, or what kind of support apart from that do you rely on from your teams? So my team is everything. My team enables every single thing that comes out of our learning organization. Um, some specific things that my team does that I just am so grateful for. I have really wonderful leaders in my organization. All my managers are fantastic. And they do a lot of portfolio management that would be too much for me because there's too many projects going on all the time. I, you know, I, I cannot micromanage anyone and they, my leaders are fantastic. Um, so a lot of program management there, portfolio management. My facilitators get really in the weeds. If they're doing a calls class, they will listen to phone calls, hours and hours of phone calls. They will do job shadows with people that are in the organization. They meet with frontline leaders or team leads, and so do my managers. But the facilitators really help figure out the what, what's going on. And they really partner with the learning designers to create something that's both instructionally sound and amazing. Um, so their subject matter expertise is very um, beneficial to the organization, but they're also very creative. I really rely on that creativity to just not do the same thing in the same way all the time, but to think about what is it that would be really helpful if we did here? What's a different way to do this? So they actually pay attention. 
Um, and then I have an organization effectiveness team, and they do some pretty amazing things too. They, we, we have um, someone who pulls together all of our data and helps us figure out, we have a, we're getting together a data warehouse, which will link all of our sources of those metrics that we really are going to need to finish out some of these projects. Um, and then they're working on how do we visualize this data? So things like dashboards, um, dashboards and other um, sources of monitoring. And they do um, <clears throat> a whole bunch of analysis on what metrics are we trying to impact? What can we gather? Or what are we trying to solve here? And I have people who do um, lots of building of internal team resources, things like SharePoint sites and Power Apps and other things that I have no, no experience in. <laughs> and then um, other people who do our learning content management um, inside of our LMS. So I would say that every single person on my team is critical and every single one of them has some element of a really niche skill that our team relies on in some way. So I, I couldn't do without any of them. Excellent. Sounds like you have a, you know, a, a great set of people who all are contributing in their unique ways. Uh, I, right. I, I find most unique, uh, which is not usually there. I'm sure there will be, you know, a bit of it happening is probably uh, the organizational effectiveness team where they are doing a lot of mm -hmm. data crunching and visualization and focus on metrics. You know, uh, maybe you are ahead of the curve uh, over there comparatively. Uh, so, can you talk a little more about that? You know, where you are, how does it report to your uh, management from what this team tells you, etc., and how does that influence maybe your planning actions in the coming months or year? Okay, so this is also a journey that we've been on. This organization effectiveness team was new as of last year. Our team was structured in a different way. We had a team of facilitators, a team of designers, and then a couple people who did um, Power BI, Power Apps, Power Automate, mm -hmm. and SharePoint just on their own individually. and we really wanted to get to a place where we could not just prove our worth to the business. I, you know, that's always a, a journey that you're on, but we really wanted to get to the place where we said, how can we help fix things? And the way we wanted to help fix things was by knowing what was going on, knowing what was going wrong, okay. knowing what was going right, and then being able to present that to the business and say, Here's where we're going, you know, here's where we were, here's where we're going, here's what we suggest. Because the more we can understand what's happening inside of a particular team or in, inside of a particular line of business, the more we can say, there's an intervention that needs to happen right here in this particular point in the process or in this particular job function, it's, it's trending down and we need to intervene right now. We wouldn't have that ability if we didn't have this organization effectiveness team. All of the, the metrics and data work was kind of spread out and other people were trying to do it while they're trying to do other parts of their job. Like a facilitator was also doing data work and you know, a designer was also doing the learning content management aspect. And we said, well, instead of having all this little bits of work interspersed with different people and it not being anyone's sole focus, Maybe five people are doing data as 20% of their job. Well, why don't we move all of those 20% over to one person and have the other designers and facilitators do 100% design and facilitation so that we moved all these interspersed little parts into this is someone's full focus and they can actually put some significant time into managing that work and getting really good at it. We thought it would be more efficient and more effective to have all of that work kind of centralized into one team. So we just did that last summer. Um, our team came into this organization from another part of the business and we've been restructuring and working on how we do things. And um, 
you know, so far we're doing great. We have got some great stuff planned for this year, which I think will be really helpful in, in terms of um, measurement and um, giving insights to our partners now. Excellent. Excellent. So the, for, for, for the team to identify these are the areas where we need some intervention, uh, they are also tracking business metrics, not just learning and training metrics, right? We, we really try to get some, of course, learning results. You know, how are people doing in class? How are people doing on their evaluations on particular topics? We really try to bring in quality scores. I think we have a pretty solid handle on what all the, the quality scores are for particular areas. Um, what, and just like I mentioned before, how well are people adhering to the processes and procedures they're supposed to? How are they being compliant? Um, all those kinds of things are metrics that we're bringing in to our, mm -hmm. our, our data lake so that we can pull from right there. Excellent. That's that's wonderful. In fact, you know, that's something that uh, uh, would greatly help in uh, identifying trends and gaps early. And, you know, mm -hmm. if you're able to fill those gaps, like you said, what can we fix? If you are able to do that, uh, even before business stakeholders come to you to ask, how can we fix it? You go back with yeah. your suggestions, etc. That's wonderful. I think that's hugely, you know, trust building and and placing yourself in that consultant position and value added L and D team. Yeah, I hope we're I hope we're doing good work in that area. We are still building all of it, so it's not it's not a hundred percent done yet. Still a work in progress, but I would say that this will give us the ability to be a much more effective partner than I think we would have been in the past. So we're still on that journey. We still have, you know, a long way to go in building out those reporting functionalities and all that stuff. But I think we're in a good place and we have great business partners helping us on their side with what do we want to see, um, what kind of what kind of data would be helpful, all that stuff. No, absolutely. You are definitely in a great place. Uh, you know, and, and I wish that you continue on this and achieve great success. Uh, yeah. So whatever you've done so far, uh, Laura, what has been or what have been your biggest takeaways, learnings uh, while you have been trying to positively impact uh, business metrics? Oh, the business um, moved faster than I, I thought and the technology moves slower. <laughs> so, yes, the our business partners are incredibly responsive. They're so kind and so helpful, getting us the information we need. You know, when there's changes, they're very agile. Um, you know, but sometimes a larger organization is, is um, you know, faster than, than the technology is ready to go. Um, you know, there is a, a technology thing that's been holding us up on our program, and it's hard to be patient when you really just want to hurry up and get things done, right? But I think that's I think that's the lesson. Just do a little bit every day. We just try and get a little bit more done every day and just know we'll do what we can. Some of these things might take a long time for the tool to be ready or for the technology to catch up or you know, whatever it is, these things take a long time. You know, we're not talking about a runway of a couple months on a, a big project. It might be a year. It might be a year and a half or two years. So one of my biggest lessons learned was I need to be patient with myself and with my expectations, appropriately manage expectations, because some of these interventions are long-term things and they're not just, you know, snap your fingers and it's fixed. Anything else that comes to your mind as a as a big takeaway over the years? Um, you know, one of the things that I would say not just for impact, but for leadership in general, um, I have realized that the further and further up I have gone is the power of delegation. And when I was when I was first, I was first a leader. Uh, several years ago, many years ago, um, 
I had a very difficult time not still being in the work. And one of my amazing, amazing associates, her name is Krista. I hope she watches this. She came to me and she said, Laura, we've got it. We've got it. We can do this. You can lead us and we will do all the work of, you know, the building. And I just, I just said, okay. <laughs> and I still had to learn that lesson of it's not your job to build the things now. It is your job to enable the people to do the things. And, you know, that's a, that's a very long-term lesson because the higher you go up in leadership, the more you have to delegate. And the things that got you to here will not get you to here. So one of my biggest lessons here is having to delegate more than I have in the past. And just knowing my team's got it. You know, I hire people that are smarter than me for a reason. And the people that I inherited who are amazing can do great things if I just let them fly. So it's a disservice to them if I don't delegate. It's a disservice to them if I try and do all of the things all the time. And I get less done because I have too many meetings to do a great job of, you know, representing the metrics myself, or I, you know, I haven't tried to do that because that's not my wheelhouse. I hire people who really know how to do that. But, um, you know, this is one of those leadership lessons that I learn again and again at every single level and on every single project. Give the people that are good at this thing the ability to shine at it. And, you know, my people who are great at data and great at data visualization and, um, you know, great at developing content. They need that chance to show what they're worth and stretch their wings. Because I want them to go to that next role with a lot of really great experience building these programs and saying, I built this and this helps the business in X way. I was a direct contributor and I did that and have that pride. So it's not directly tied to the impact, but I think that's a big lesson that I learned, especially along this journey. Yeah, and an important one. I think, you know, something that all managers and senior managers as they grow into leadership positions, they need to learn. And it could be a little unnerving at first because you're leaving your comfort area and your skills and trying to not do that and let someone else do. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it would it would lead to impact because you are developing so many other people who are doing their specialized role better. So together as a team, uh, it is going to contribute to bigger impact for sure. Mm. I hope so. I hope so. There's some pretty pretty great people who are building up some fantastic skills, and I'm really proud of them because I could not have imagined how they would just blossom and do great things with these with these projects. Right, Laura. Fantastic. Uh, what what would be your advice to L and D teams, professionals uh, who are trying to get started uh, on impacting business metrics or you know, in this side, you know, moving away from, let's say, level one and two kind of uh, measurement to level three and four? Um, <clears throat> so probably my biggest advice would be work with your clients, the people who you're building a partnership with, to figure out what are some issues that they're team or channel or line of business or department is really struggling with. The things that they're struggling with are going to be those places where there's opportunity for you to make an intervention. So your clients will know, well, X is one of the biggest challenges that we're facing right now. We're trying to figure out how to address it. Inside of those particular challenges or those, those areas that the business is struggling with, there will be particular things that training can impact, that training can help fix. So maybe there is a, like a uh, efficiency issue. And if you train people on that particular, how to do that process better, they get faster at it. Or maybe you find out that there is a subject matter expert who was trained a long, long time ago and the process has changed and they haven't had an upskill in a long time, and they need an upskill, and all the people that are under them need an upskill. You know, there are those little places where we can really 
turn the dial. So look for those little pockets where training can make a difference and then figure out, you have to do a needs analysis. What is the actual issue here? How can we impact this? And do a little pilot. Figure out, is there a way we can measure how this was doing before and how this was after? So there's a couple things you can do. You can run an A-B test, which is where you figure out this pocket of associates hasn't been trained. And we're going to we're gonna test their proficiency at this thing before, and then we're going to test their proficiency after. Nothing's changed. We're just going to see how they change over time. And then your B group, you, whatever one can be your A or B group, doesn't matter. Your group that you train, you're going to figure out how they're how they're doing over here before the training and figure out how they do afterward. So you have a control group. You can figure out, is this something that is, you know, linked to training? Um, you can do a pilot so that you see, you know, the efficiency of doing this thing. You can do, you know, studies over time. There's, there's a whole bunch of things you can do to figure out what type of, what type of change you can affect. But, just get started with figuring out where are the problems. That's what I would say. Excellent. Excellent. Any any advice that you may have on uh, books? I know you uh, read. So. Okay. So probably the book that I would say that's um, really helpful. I'm in the middle of it right now. Is a book called Seeing the Big Picture. It's about developing business acumen. Um, and it's by Kevin Cope. He started um, Acumen Learning. I got that book at a conference a few months ago, and it was really helpful for me because I, this, this one lady who was um, speaking said <clears throat> to all of us learning executives, you need to stop seeing yourself as a learning leader. You need to start seeing yourself as a business leader who develops people. And that's, that really blew my mind. Um, and so I just started figuring out what are some other ways that I can understand the business better? What are some ways that I can truly get in the weeds on what do we do? How do we make money? And seeing the big picture, has, it teaches you about cash, net income, profit, EBITDA, all of these things that a lot of learning leaders have just no experience in unless you've done like an executive MBA. Um, but it's really opened my eyes to, I am a little microcosm in the business, but I'm a cost center. So how do I show my value and can I show a return on the investment that they're making in my team? And I'm working on that now. I'm definitely not all the way there yet, but it's, it's changing my thinking around how am I, how am I involved in the business? I am an integral part of the business. I'm not just the learning team that's attached to the business. I help us make money if I can improve some of these metrics. So I'm trying to figure that out right now. I'm going to try and, I'm going to try and make more of an impact even this year. But um, I just, I love that book because it showed me where do I fit in and how do I help us without saying impact again <laughs> how do i help us make a difference i guess that's fantastic i haven't read that book so i will i will look that up uh, i have another one <laughs> um this is one of my favorites yeah. leaders eat last i'm in cynic you probably had somebody else recommend this before this is one of my favorites yeah. um i go back to it again and again just because i i just I deeply appreciate how he approaches leadership and how he serves the people that work for him. Excellent. Uh, you know, uh, from all the things that you have spoken today, Laura, I see that you you probably have what has been captured in a book called The Trusted Learning Advisor by Dr. Keith Keating. And if you may want to Take a look at that. It'll resonate highly with you. And it might be a good pass along to your team if they are getting on that same journey and if they are kind of looking at developing themselves similarly into these roles. I, I found that what you The did, Trusted Learning Advisor? 
it's it's been captured by Dr. Keith Keating. Uh, yes. Okay. But fantastic. I will check it out. Thank you. Yeah. Right, Laura. Thank you so much. It's well, it was wonderful uh, having a chat with you. So many interesting insights that are there, and I'm sure our audience will love it. They will pick up so many great points from this conversation. Well, thank you, and I I'm glad I could I'm glad I could do it. I had a little cold, so pardon the snuffles. But um, you know the the best thing about these kinds of conversations is that not that anybody does it the same way that you would do it, but you pick up little nuggets along the way of oh that's an interesting thing. Maybe I can apply that to my own practice. And you know I love I love watching and listening to podcasts because. I'm not going to just pick things up and do it that other person's way. I'm going to pick it up and do it my way, the way that works for me. So I hope other people can do that with my experience too. No, absolutely. And and our our hope with the podcast series that if people can get one idea uh, from an episode, that's great. You go ahead and implement it. We can twist it the way it works for you uh, because every situation and organization is different. But yeah, it's it kind of sparks the ideas for people. Once again, thank you so much. Agree. We really appreciate it. Thank you.